Attention, please. I would like to call the October meeting of the Crooked Creek Art League officially open. Welcome for our first in-person meeting in a year. Well, not really, because we did have one in April. So good to see so many fresh faces and just so good to be back together. Uh, we look forward to those of you on Zoom because we're actually doing two things. We're Zooming and we're here. So that's a real blessing for us. And we thank Jim for helping us and all and Barbara and Alex and Sandra and Maureen and Bobby for being on this call the other day when we were doing a dry run of this and we finally got it straightened so. out. We hope things are gonna go well. As I well. said, this is our first time of trying to Zoom and do a live meeting. And we're really excited about our guest speaker tonight also. Uh, anybody present that won at the state fair or at Union, would you please stand? I'm standing at my house. Let's give them a big round of applause. Congratulations. We're excited for you. And for those of you who are not here, we're excited for you too for winning those places. Is there any <coughs> other announcements? Um, in the notes, I hope you um, get your emails and you look. It's got our financial report. It's got all the meeting and the minutes for what we're discussing. So you should know what's abreast. And we're trying to do what we can to meet the guidelines here and to have as much as we can for everybody, not just those who are able to get out and about. Debbie. Do you have any announcements that you want to make? Um, our speaker will um, our presentation next month has a confirmation of the last day of the season. What do you want? What do you want? Huh? Book. Book. Oh. Oh. Information too, um, what do you want? Huh? Good girl, good girl. <laughs> okay, if you did not hear that, um, Michael Story is our November speaker. And you look on the website and you can catch up on all the information. We're really excited about that. Um, <laughs> I do wanna remind you that we have still hopes. Uh, your deadline for entering is November the 10th. Uh, we do have a reception this year, unless something changes. Uh, and right now it's for December the 10th, right? 9th, 11th. 11th. So Saturday afternoon. So anyway, just keep that in mind. And if you have not entered, please get your entries in. Still Hopes has remodeled and they have a whole new area for us to display. And each picture is going to have a little light that comes down and it is awesome it is a awesome place to display so please uh, it's on the prospectus okay. if you look online you can click on the top it's pretty much the same as everything else we have we are limited on the number of photos we can take in but right now we're okay it's, it's those are 50 pieces of artwork an active member, in other words, your renewal must have been done. It's not a mix, it's just active membership. Um, same size limitations as the show here, so minimum 12, maximum 12. There will be, there will be prizes. It's, it's, I think there's four prizes, and it doesn't show it first and third. I think this is what it is. Um, it is a jury show. Uh, Stephen Whetstone is the judge. Uh, he has a gallery down on Bull Street down in that area somewhere. The climb. the climb is the name of it. So. Who's part of the climb? Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's different pictures for those things. 
All right, uh, but I do want to encourage you to sign up for Still Hopes because um, that's our first fall exhibition. It's the first one we've had since last spring, and I think you got some good work. I'm sure that y'all have completed at all the time that you're home. <laughs> all right, does anybody else have any announcements? Or yes, ma'am, Mary. Uh, I'm going to send around to sign up. Mary is passing around a clipboard for you to sign up to help find sponsors. Or if you would like to sponsor the um, shows, please sign up when it comes around. Right. There is a sign up sheet online for other jobs for the shows also. Okay. <clears throat> now, I am not going to, yes. Al. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, a number of us get together on Wednesday morning for open paint. Everybody is welcome. We can't have this crowd. <laughs> but, you know, uh, doesn't matter skill level. We just, there's no instructor. You just come and paint. And it's from nine to roughly around 12. And where is it located? At the art room. Okay. In the art room on Wednesdays, nine to 12. They have open paint. All skill levels are welcome and encouraged to attend. And it's all fun. Just remember, it's us. We like to be together. Okay, now. And sometimes we go to lunch afterwards. And sometimes they go to lunch afterwards, and that's the good part. I like to eat. Okay, I'm going to turn the program over to Debbie, who's going to introduce... <clears throat> our guest speaker and we're going to start our program. I wanted to introduce our presenter um, <coughs> today, uh, Sandy. Project. Usually that's not a problem for me. <laughs> Is that better? Is that better? I uh, wanted to introduce uh, Sandy Demke and uh, I met Sandy at the National Association of Women Artists Group here in South Carolina. Um, that, that was how I was introduced to her. Um, and she has been a wonderful help. I'm sorry. I, is that okay? That's okay. Uh, Sandy has been very helpful to me. I was new to the organization. Um, she's made sure that I was familiar with everything and been very helpful in um, entering uh, some of my work and some of the uh, presentations that they do and the competitions that they sponsor. Um, so I was very pleased that she could join us. She is actually here from Beaufort. So she, she drove up specially for us. <laughs> Her background, um, she spent 25 years in architectural photography uh, in Connecticut. And she and her okay. husband, Russ, now reside in Beaufort, of, of course, where she concentrates on fine art photography. Um, her impressive resume is online if you want to take a look at it. Um, she's the vice chair of the print division of the Photographic Society of America, and she's received numerous awards, some being Best in Show 2010 in the Carolina's Nature Photographers Conference and three first place medals at the Photographic Society of America conferences in 2017 through 19. Uh, also, in September of 2019, she was invited to be a guest exhibitor at the Photographic Society of America Conference in Spokane, Washington, where 17 photographs were on view. She's also a publisher. She has two photography books, Hands Across the Low Country and Cats of Beaufort. Her photographs have also graced the cover of Char Charleston Salt and Iron along Southern Roads and collections of her images have appeared in Southern Traditions and Downsize. So I'm very proud to present Sandy. She's going to talk to us uh, from the standpoint of composition, which applies to both photography and art. So I think all of us will find her information very useful. So Sandy, I'll let you take over. I'm making sure I knew that this phone was gonna go off sometime during this. And I just turned it off. The phone is off, my mask is down. Uh, um, okay, so I'm Sandy Dimke. As Debbie uh, said, I'm here from Buford and I actually, a couple slides from here, if we could, if we could flip on the um, PowerPoint. 
we had a little issue with the PowerPoint. Uh, some of the slides, the, the fonts weren't um, compatible with the computer that we're using here. So you'll see some weird, weird letters and you have to figure out what we actually are trying to say, <laughs> but uh, uh, I'll go through it with you. But um, the topic is composition. And all of you, I'm assuming most of you have been painters or photographers or some type of creative person for many, many years. And you're probably thinking, what can I learn today? Why am I coming to this thing? And you're not gonna really learn anything about composition. But what I'm going to do is I'm gonna remind you about all the things that are part of composition and how this really impacts you having a really wonderful piece of art at the end of this. So that, that's my goal and hopefully that will, that will work for you. If you flip to the next slide, it's just about me. Um, I, am, I consider myself a photographer and an artist. As Debbie said, um, I'm on, I'm, I met her through the National Association of Women Artists and I consider myself an artist, not just a photographer. One of my goals in Buford Art Association and also with NAWA is to promote photography as an art. So, you know, I'm, I'm really more into the art aspect of it. So you'll, you'll see, and I do have some photographs um, in the presentation for those of you who are photographers um, because the same illustration fits for both uh, fine art and photography. The next slide, Debbie covered most of this. Um, born and raised in upstate New York. I'm a member of Buford Art Association. I was juried into the National Association of Women Artists just two years ago in 2019. And I'm on the, um, the um, South, we have a chapter in South Carolina and I'm on the board of the uh, South Carolina chapter. Um, I am now, as unfortunately I didn't tell Debbie, I am now the chairperson of the print division of the um, Photographic Society of America. So I do a lot of printing and one of my um, uh, jobs is to also uh, <clears throat> help people understand that when they take photographs, it really isn't a photograph until you print it. It doesn't help to keep it on your monitor and it doesn't help to have it in your phone. Um, so that's, that's one of my other asides uh, in my life. Um, and that's it, she's, she's covered all the rest of this. You can go on to the next slide and we'll, we'll start right with the presentation. So as you see, we have composition, <laughs> things are moving around there, but the, let's start with just the basic definition. So composition, is positioning and arranging objects to lead the viewer's eye to the most interesting or significant area of the capture. Now, this is the definition in any, you know, when you look it up online or in the old dictionaries. And, and that's, it's true. There's nothing wrong about that. It's definitely exactly what happened, but there's a lot more going on in composition. Next slide. So there's a lot more to it than just that layout. Just that layout making that eye go to the important part of the composition, no. It means, and these, we're gonna cover all these things, leading lines, diagonals, foreground dominance, framing, patterns and textures, simplicity, depth, negative space, balance of colors, and, and a few other things that I've thrown in. So, so you don't usually think of that, but it, all part of composition. It's not, composition isn't just the layout of your picture. Next slide. So why is it important? Um, because the most, the more complete your understanding of all these techniques of all that we just went through, the more powerfully you can share your vision. And that's the idea, I think, go to the next slide. I need um, to charge it to keep going. Um, the, the whole idea of you actually painting or photographing or creating is you want to share your vision. You want to share something with the other people. Most people are not just painting for themselves. They're painting because they want this piece to be shown. They want people to like it, but they want people to see what they see when they paint it. And that's the whole thing that we're going to go through today is how we can make that happen. You wanna share your vision and we're gonna do it through composition, through all those elements of composition. So you, it allows that artist to make a statement and share your vision with the audience. Next one. So it's a means to that end. 
that composition, mm -hmm. just that total means to an end. Next slide. So we're going to start. It can be, it's not just for landscape photography or landscape painting, which a lot of people think, oh, composition, they're only going to talk about, you know, a beautiful scene. And like the scenes I was just showing, showing you a couple of minutes ago. No, it's true. Everything will be true if it's, um, if it's a nature, if it's botanical art, still life, portrait, architecture, even abstract art. The very last slide that we're going to do is actually abstract art. And it does have composition to make it come together, OK? We can go to the next slide. Uh, the next one. <laughs> OK, so these, these are the ingredients. Um, all this, now, you again, you're probably never thinking of all this as composition, but it is. The color that you use, this, the lines going through, the depth, the shapes, the space that was left or not left, textures, your values, all that is part of composition. Where's my little, uh, here we go. I don't know if, I'm gonna just test and see if this works on the screen. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't, doesn't work on the screen. I'm gonna have to use my fingers. <laughs> this is for my cat normally. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, but move along. <laughs> you can go to the next slide. Okay, these are the guidelines. Next slide. Um, these are not, I'm gonna go through these guidelines and this is what the most of the presentation is but these are not hard and fast rules, guidelines. Next slide, guide, yes. So Picasso said, learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist. So keep that in mind throughout the whole thing. I want you to learn today. I want you to, I want you to pay attention. And so when you're going back to your easel or, or doing your Wednesday morning painting that you can sit down and say, oh, okay, I think I need to do this. Or I can, if I do this, maybe people will see what I'm trying to say. So go ahead. So don't get caught up with these terms though that we're gonna be using, the diagonals and lines and color and value and all that. Um, they just help to articulate what you're talking about. It's just kind of like the glue that holds it all together. So, okay. Now, this would be a painting or a sketch or a drawing, whatever. If you ask someone in kindergarten, maybe to, to draw, that's what they would do. Now, hopefully you see that it really doesn't have any good composition in it. I mean, there's really, you know, it's, it's, um, the, uh, the subject is put right in the middle of the, of the page, both sideways, and there's really nothing to it. Well, this is where everybody starts. And so I hope that as you think about all these rules, you can think about how you've grown from the first, very first attempt at drawing. So next slide. So we're gonna start with all these guidelines. So the first and the easiest guideline <coughs> is leading lines. <coughs> leading lines are so important because in the, in the West, um, Western civilization like we're in, we read from the left to the right. You all know this. And so the leading line is the important thing because it leads the viewer into the picture. Next slide. So here is a, a very nice picture and it's very easy to see if you go to the next slide exactly where that leading line takes you it took you right from the beginning it circled you around and it brought you right to the middle that's think about that as you're doing your painting that's what you should be that's one of the goals you should have having the viewer look through and then bring it to wherever you want to stop where it should be next slide we're just going to go through a bunch of leading lines. Same thing with this one by Sargent. It should be not sketching his wife, but with his wife. But uh, <laughs> uh, she's like looking in the other, totally the other direction. But again, the line takes you from the left side here right up to his hat, brings you around past her back to exactly what he's doing. Sargent wanted you to get the feeling of this artist being there and being 
basically solitary. The wife isn't paying much attention. And as you see, you see her and then you go right up to, to his face um, because of the colors in it. The other interesting thing here, and we'll touch on color too. Notice how he used all these wonderful colors of grass all the way around. I mean, almost every blade of grass is a different shade, but he's framed it. And one of the topics we're gonna to talk about is framing. He framed that, those, that couple together within all those grasses. And he thought that through first, I hope, I'm gonna assume, um, and, and basically gave it that type of frame so that your eye again doesn't go up here because this is the lightest part and sometimes, or one of the lighter parts and sometimes your eye would go here, but it doesn't. It leads right into that, picks these two light point points here and then rests on, on him, so. Next slide. Okay, this is one of my slides. This is, um, this is a picture in um, Kinderdink, Holland. And um, it did very well. I love the green grass over here. I love the composition until mm -hmm. I, and, it, and it, it did okay in some competition and stuff. But then I decided, mm -hmm. so this is, how I, this is how I took it. This is how I envisioned the picture when I actually took it. But if you go to the next slide again, you can see how much better this is with the leading line coming through here, the windmills up on top. Everything is so much better and it has won much more competitions this way, even though it really wasn't how I envisioned it. But uh, I should have. I should have you know, played paid more attention when I was taking the picture. But so again, the leading lines like that. Next picture. So here we have an L. Very, a very typical layout, um, again, because so your eye starts here, but goes right through. Because it's a lighter color, your eye doesn't really stop there, it goes right through. The next slide is a similar one, um, reverse L, but the same idea, your line comes, your eye comes here, and with, without my little box around it, I mean, it's a beautiful picture, you know, you could, you could easily end, you know, end your composition right there, it's, it's done. Next slide. So still within that whole left to right leading lines, um, you see the same idea here. You take your, you go up here and then you circle around and you end at those people. That's what he wanted you to see was those two people sitting there. It wasn't necessarily the staircase, even though that's what your eye goes to first, but your eye does keep moving. So you need to get movement in your pictures also, in your paintings. Next slide. Same thing here. Your eye goes here, moves around, comes back to the boat, kind of goes up with here, goes back this way. Next slide. Um, diagonals again, you see them moving back and forth. Keeping your, keeping the diagonals create that movement in there. Next slide. All right, this one we're gonna, I, I shouldn't have really put it exactly where it is um, because it, it has so many characteristics and probably should have been at the end. But one of the things he did when we were talking about the diagonals is here, the diagonals are going here and here leading to these two, this couple that's pushed over into the corner. And when I was reading about the painting and Basically, he, it was just when they started photography and he wanted it to look like a snapshot. He wanted it to look like what he painted this. He wanted it, this is Degas. He wanted it to look like he was a patron in this bar too and basically snapped a picture of it, of, of this couple. It was, it was done really um, for a couple reasons, but one of the things that was, it was promoting was, was the, um, non-use of alcohol, um, you know, he looks like he's an alcoholic already. She's looked like she's had, you know, a few too many to drink already. His, her feet are kind of moved side by side and everything. But um, anyways, one of, the, one of the, the points is, is that all these diagonals here, even though they're pushed into the corner, the diagonals lead you right to that. The light behind her makes her jump out 
Um, and again, because she's all in the light dress, she's the important person as opposed to him who's darker. So these are just things that as you're planning what you're doing, whether you're out doing a plein air piece or, or doing a still life at home or, or, or painting from a, a photograph that you've taken someplace, is to, you know what you want to say, you know what you want to produce, you know that feeling that you want um, everyone to feel when they see it. And these again, as I'm going through, are ways that you can accomplish this. These are ways that you can get the viewer, hopefully to see what you want them to see. Next slide. Okay, curves, this is an easy one. Obviously curves, not only do they give you the movement, but they make the viewer's eyes go right through the picture. Next slide. So Van Gogh, you know, perfectly uh, um, uh, illustrates this um, with his movement, how you come in here, it circles around, you go around here and you come right back to that um, dark, smoke, whatever, in the sky. Next slide. Same thing with our screamer. Um, this gives you both the rhythm, you know, because of the way um, the lines are done here, and also the movement going from the diagonal, circling around, and coming right back to him. So try it. Try, try some of that at home. Um, you know, getting, getting the eye to move right through the picture. Next slide. So just some illustrations. Um, uh, curves going through snow. Hopefully we don't have any this year, and especially in Beaufort. <laughs> and then even um, uh, carnival rides, keeping the interest up through, through curves. Go ahead. Another pretty obvious one that you all know, but um, sel probably seldom think about is really using a lot of diagonals. Um, diagonals and triangles, keeping things right in these curves. Next slide. So here, I've got it in red there. All the different triangles really make a very interesting picture. Next slide. Now, even a still life like this is really the triangles here, the triangle here. Next slide. Another triangle, hopefully you can see, makes it much more interesting when you've got this triangle going up towards the uh, sun reflection. Next slide. Same idea here. Big triangle. It wouldn't have been as interesting if there was more of the sky, you wouldn't, you wouldn't um, focus as much on that, but just by creating that triangle down here. Okay. Triangle more than curves. Say. It seems like it's curves. It is, it is curves, but the, but this, the whole picture here is in a triangle. Yeah. The important part of it is, is in the triangle, but you're right. There is, there's definitely curves showing the movement here. Too many elements in that one. <laughs> okay. Next one. Now, especially for the photographers, but also for the artists, change that perspective. I, I show the guy down on his knees, but getting a totally different perspective um, could really make, I'm not saying that it, it, it's gonna help you get your, message across, but it could open your eyes to some different messages that you want to get across. So um, change that perspective. Take a, take a look at the next slide. Um, we've got, you know, um, uh, again, down there, looking back up here. These, you know, obviously are historical pictures. The whole idea of, of looking down here and, and seeing that in the background. Almost like I, I do another slide talking about the importance of a foreground, uh, giving a, a very strong foreground. Well, that's, you know, this has a lot of those elements. It's got the, the lines going through it, but it's also um, has, has this perspective of him being down here, shooting up at all the um, religious people waiting in line or something. And then um, wait that way in the background. So next slide. Again, down on the ground. Um, shooting in that direction, um, 
really makes a, a totally different perspective. Next slide. Same thing. Okay. Or going very, very close. Now, taking if the uh, uh, if the other eye of the bird was in the picture, it would end up looking more like a snapshot, a just an ordinary picture of that bird. But by cropping it like that, giving it just that eye, your eye goes to that eye and then down to the beak. Or because the beak is brighter, maybe it does go to the beak first. My, when I'm looking at it, I go up to the eye and do that. But think about that. Instead of painting an entire bird, just taking a portion of it. They'll still tell even maybe more dramatic of a story because you'll be able to get that detail, all the details in that face and really focus on that. Next slide. So what I was talking about before, the foreground, um, give, give it some interest and some, and it will end up giving you a lot of depth. So here, for example, we've got some interesting boats in the foreground, but then your eye does go up and you see all the rest of the interesting um, uh, buildings and um, uh, architecture in Greece. Next slide. Same thing. It's, it got down very low and is photographing at this, this one, not painting it, but photographing and you really get all the textures of the rock in here. You still get the wonderful wave, but your eye goes right up here to the lighthouse and then over to the wave. So that foreground, that really dramatic, heavy, heavy foreground is what's saving that picture from just an ordinary, again, I'll say snapshot, but just an ordinary landscape picture that you might just paint. This way, it really um, adds that drama to it that, that you want to keep looking at and watching and, and wondering what those people are going to get pushed over into the into the sea. Next slide. Again, George Seurat, uh, one of his more famous ones. Same thing, foreground is essential, really makes that picture. Yes, you still see the bridge and, and the rest in the background, so you, you know it's going on in their universe. But um, having that interest that the, the dog and the, and the man right in that foreground and then moving it along, gives you that tremendous depth. Next slide. And depth, here we are, so depth. So same thing, go, you go from here to here to here to the sky and then finally to the sky. So really adding, adding a lot of depth to the, to the painting. Next slide. Here, um, you're, you're, you're emphasizing the depth because of the position of the man. You've got him, um, and you're really focusing all your attention on the man. And then the, the mountains are so far away, but you've got that feeling of depth between him and those mountains. Um, in photography, uh, when someone asks me to take a picture in front of the Eiffel Tower or something, whatever, um, I don't put them in front of the Eiffel Tower. I put them in front of me and the Eiffel Tower is in the background. So when I take the picture there, like this gentleman, is the focus of the picture, but you can, it's an environmental portrait almost. I can see what's going on in the background. I see that Eiffel Tower there, but they're the ones that are important in the picture. And that's what they want when they get home. They wanna see themselves in the Eiffel Tower. They don't wanna see the little picture of themselves like this big in the Eiffel Tower here. They wanna see themselves. So. This is kind of an aside, but think about that when you're traveling and you want your picture taken in front of some place, get right in the front of the camera, you know, get that camera right near you. And then you'll have that wonderful depth. You'll be in focus and then you'll see whatever it is in the background and it'll be a really much better picture. So, I mean, this is, this is a perfect example of that. Um, whatever the, uh, um, the mountain is in the background, but uh, you know it's there and you know how dramatic it is, but, but he becomes the most important part there. Go ahead. Same thing with the depth. Tremendous depth that you see here. Next slide. Okay, so this is one of mine. It, um, 
I was very happy to know that it actually won a gold medal this year um, in the Photographic Society of America's international competition. And one of the reasons was that the judges had said was because of the depth that it showed. So I, I'm, I'm using a telephoto lens. So the elephant is here, but everything else is in the background. You know that it's there. Um, you, you see the trees, but everything else is kind of in a, in a little fog. Um, but just, so you know what's, what's really behind, but you're focusing right on the el elephant. So um, depth, that whole idea of depth is, is so important. Um, when you're working on a on like one person or one animal or to give it um, the environment that it's in. A lot of nice diagonals. And certainly you've got your diagonal with him. Hopefully there's, a, and we've got the triangle. <laughs> so, uh, and, and most of these pictures, like I said, from the first one that we were looking at, um, the, uh, I think it was by Sergeant or um, Degas, um, there's, the best pictures have so many of these elements in it. You can, you know, you can, if you take any of the, the master's paintings and look at them, um, you know, just look at how many of these elements. You don't have to use them all, but the more you use, the more it works to tell, to tell the story. Go ahead if you can. Okay, creative framing. This is, this, can work really well for you, again, depending on the story you're gonna tell. Um, this is just you know, two guys on their bicycles uh, stopping for a, a break in the afternoon, but giving that frame around it, it breaks up all the patterns, yet patterns are good. Um, it keeps your interest, the movement of all the lines there, but the framing, if, if it didn't have that framing, it would not be a good, it would not be a good picture at all. It would be very boring. Again, it would look like a snapshot, but having the framing around it adds quite a bit of interest. Next slide. Same thing here. All that wonderful framing around the trees, bringing those leaves right down to it. Makes a huge difference. Here, the framing is the gates. Instead of walking inside and painting this wonderful picture of the uh, of this uh, of this vintage home, this historic home um, in Beaufort, um, you come outside the gate, add the gate in there. It adds to the whole historic flavor of it, and yet it adds so much more interest because you've got these wonderful curves and lines and and uh, patterns and textures. Everything else that adds adds to a more interesting picture. Go ahead. The frame, same thing, but this is a frame within the frame. So I mean, these can be these can be quite quite interesting to try to try to do some of that. Adding, um, you know, painting the picture through a frame. Um, you know, at, including a frame in the picture if it if it makes sense. I mean, this was in, looking from inside of a building out at this boy, so it, it did make sense to include it. Go ahead. Um, this is one of one of the this is one of my pictures, and I call it taking Florence home in my suitcase. <laughs> and that actually metal frame of the suitcase is on a hill in Florence, overlooking Florence. And we happen to be walking up the hill, passing this, and it was a perfect place to stop and catch your breath. And I looked over and was like, Oh my God, that's a suitcase. <laughs> and so I went over and was like. And look what we can see through the suitcase. So I went and, and um, um, positioned myself. Unfortunately, um, there were some cranes and stuff in there, but you know, what can you do? But um, um, you know, again, it's it's an interesting frame that um, you know will um, it will remind you certainly of your time in Florence. So you know, painting something like that, and you could do that. You could do something like that with any of your uh, travel pictures that you want to paint. You know, come home and just paint a suitcase around it. It 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 works out very well. Next slide. So again, framing just to, to add so much interest to it um, through the doors, looking at the church through these old um, uh, rustic doors, um, using the um, uh, the ceiling of a a building near it to, to create uh, a frame around um, uh, the, the Carillon and, and that uh, college. 
And then this was the last one was in Cuba. And, and the, again, using the, the wood, the rustic wood. Um, so you see that you're looking through a doorway into a courtyard adds so much more to the story that I wanted to tell. If I had just walked into the doorway and you see all this clutter, it wouldn't be as interesting as having you actually looking through and knowing that it is, it is something that you're looking through. Go ahead. Um, patterns and textures can just flip through some of these. Um, again, you know, just, it, it just adds some more interest to a picture. Go ahead. This is the same Caroline as in the other picture, but I did it as a reflection this time. Um, just, you know, watch, watch for something that looks interesting to you and it's probably gonna be interesting to someone else too. So you might wanna take that idea home with you and try to paint something like that. Next slide. Um, again, um, I, I didn't, I don't know who painted this, but the same idea with, with the patterns, um, not necessarily the textures, I think the texture is actually from the canvas that they used, but um, all, all the patterns that were used you know, continuously, whether it was the color pattern or the triangular patterns um, really made for a very interesting, more abstract piece. Next slide. Now, William Morris, um, I was able to see quite a bit of his work when I was in Scotland, I was very intrigued by it. Um, all those patterns, I mean, he did wallpaper patterns and everything else, but just the beauty of the patterns that he used, he just kept using the same design over and over, but just using different shades when he was putting them together. So, so um, I mean, the, just the colors that he used, the same, this is the same leaf possibly as another one, another one over here but just changing, using the patterns continuously, but just changing the colors um, out a little bit. Next slide. Um, this again is, is totally into the, all these different patterns and textures. Uh, the reflection here has all the wonderful patterns up here, but they're more muted because they're just the reflection. So um, it, it, it really adds so much to the, to the image. Okay. Again, we've got patterns because there's, they're identical going, going back and forth. And we also have all the texture from their uniform, from the, the ground on the bottom, keeping that, that gravelly um, uh, blacktop type pe uh, texture in there too. So go ahead. And this is a reflection. This is a reflection of downtown Pittsburgh, or maybe not downtown, but a residential area of Pittsburgh um, in a hotel window. This is looking at, a, at a, another hotel who's reflecting all this. Um, and, and again, it almost looks like a, uh, an abstract painting, but it's directly uh, uh, yeah, a photograph. This is a photograph, but uh, um, you know, just kind of a, an abstract look at what um, residential Pittsburgh or mi maybe middle-class Pittsburgh uh, looks like. So next shot. Again, patterns and textures. Okay. And then um, this you could easily do and paint this. This is just a cityscape, but it was taken through a window during the rain. So the same idea, you can create this. You, you can, um, if you wanted to show, you know, how really gloomy and your life was or whatever and paint it through, through some um, snow, through some um, rain and, and you know, create that whole atmosphere about it. Go ahead. Textures of the water, textures of the, of the uh, sea. If it didn't, if it, if that beach didn't have those wonderful textures to it, it wouldn't be a great painting at all. But having, having that texture to it, you want to keep looking at it. You, you feel that the water is moving right onto the beach. Okay. Here, this is over in the Palouse uh, in Washington, Eastern, Eastern Washington State. And you've got everything. You've got the lines going through. You've got diagonals. You've got 
hills giving the curves. You've got patterns in there of the um, uh, mowing of the fields, because this was done in the fall a couple of years ago. Um, yet your eye, because of that diagonal, your eye goes right through here. It goes up into this, to that building. Okay. The total other end of it, if you're doing botanicals, if you're doing just some um, uh, flower photography or flower painting, um, identify the most important subject or the scene, which, and to me for this one, it was the Queen Anne's lice. Try to isolate it by avoiding that color around it so the viewer has no other choice but to look up at that. So leaving the green in is nice for the contrast and it has a, um, I used a, uh, like a, a really deep burgundy background on that. I don't know if you can see it through there, but it is a, um, it's not a black, it's, it's kind of a, a ruby red dark color back and it made that green stand out and it also made the white Queen Anne's lace stand out. Um, and this was a photograph, but this is similar to what you certainly can paint. The way I had to photograph this for the photographers who may be here around soon was I had to put a piece of background behind the Queen Anne's lace to, to um, diffuse it so that there, I didn't see everything else that was there. Even if I shot it with a, with a very low um, f-stop, f2 or something like that, I would still see some clutter behind me. Um, because I was shooting it so close. Well, with this, by putting a backdrop in there, and then I just changed the color of the backdrop to this. Um, I used a dark backdrop, but I just changed the color of it um, to that dark purplish color um, because I thought it looked better with the, with the green. Next slide. Okay, it's totally the same idea of simplicity. All we're showing here is a feather and the reflection. <laughs> I thought I touched something. <laughs> um, again, a very, a very, very simple picture, but it it tells the story that the photographer it wasn't me. It was a, a friend of mine who took this picture that she wanted to to um, to portray. Uh, it was just a very simple, and she has it hanging in her house. And it's just a very comforting, soothing um, image to look at, okay? Very easy to paint. And then of course we have Pizarro. Who, it looks like it's not simple, but he claims it was one of his more simplistic pictures because he didn't use a lot of detail. So you can take simplicity kind of in a different way. Um, you know, easy brush strokes that he used on it. Um, there really wasn't any defined, you really can't see the definition, especially here in the trees back here, even in the buildings, he just um, uh, used the brush strokes to, to make it a, a more simplistic picture. Next picture. Um, kind of the same idea here, not um, keeping things simple, just giving the idea of the buildings and the rock formation that this is on top of and the mountains behind it, you doing it as simple as possible by just using um, brush strokes. Go ahead. Balance, okay, we've got the, the elephant between two trees, okay, next slide. So same thing with the barns, they balance off the hills behind it and yet there's still enough um, uh, sky in the foreground to balance the part underneath it. Continue. Okay, now this picture was an example of, if you didn't look at the bottom one, um, it, it's okay. It's a picture of a little shed and it's okay. You see the nice blue water behind it, but look at if you give it a little more perspective, make the um, shed much smaller in proportion to it what a much better picture that is between the two. It, it, it looks more relevant to its surroundings than it up there. Now that, uh, the one on the top is obviously much closer. You know, that was the idea was going, but this one just gives you a, a little more feeling of your surroundings, okay? Odd numbers are always good. So go ahead. 
leaving negative space. Keep an area here. The bird is looking into that area. Think about that when you're painting birds or anything that has the potential to do action. You know, keep this area so that the bird is looking into it. Next slide. Same thing, the bird is walking in this direction. Um, so keep an area over here so that the bird has some place to walk into. Think about that when you're painting, that, that the bird needs to have a space to keep going. Next slide. Um, same idea here. This right here, it's way too close to the tip of the, to the tip of the frame. Give a little more here, just a little, but give a considerable amount over here because that's where the bird is looking. That's where he's gonna fly off to. So you don't want them to fly into nothing. You want him to fly, be able to fly into something. Go ahead. Um, same idea, leaving the action space. So this, these ducks are gonna be flying there. So you want some space on this side. You don't want your painting to end over here. You want to give it some space so that the, the ducks have some place to go. Go ahead. And this is a picture of my husband and our previous dog. And same idea. I wanted, since they were both looking in that direction, when I took the picture, I wanted to make sure that I left enough space there. So you wonder what they saw, what they were thinking. That was my idea in, in taking the picture. Next slide. Quickly, we can go through contrasting colors. Um, this is part that you all better know. <laughs> Not you should know, but you all better know. The warm, the cools, the darks, the lights, the vibrance, the muted. So next slide. So here we've got the purple and the yellow flower, making it very vibrant, um, you know, a really, really dramatic picture. Next one. Here it's the oranges and the blues that play together, which are complementary colors. And uh, so, so again, when you're deciding what colors to paint some of these things, even if you photograph something, you take it back to your studio and you're going to, to paint what you see. Do paint it how you feel. Don't necessarily paint it how it is. Paint what you feel you want it to look like. You know, paint at these vibrant colors if you're happy that day and want it to want it to be a um, just a, a very exciting picture. Next one, um, same thing, the warm and the cool we have on this one. Go ahead. Purple warm, light blue cool, the dark and the light together. Go ahead. And use the use of vibrant colors. I mean, we've got you know lots lots to you know talk about here between the, the patterns and the textures and the the leading lines and and certainly all the patterns. And, but it's the colors are what you're going to remember on both of these these pieces here. It's the colors that you're going to come come home with. What you're going to remember if you saw this picture in a gallery, you're going to remember more so the colors that you see there. Go ahead. Muted colors. This was a color picture. I changed it to black and white, and I just kept the color in the sunrise. That was all I did there, just because that was the feeling that I had when I photographed it. I, I, when it was when it was in color, I was getting the brown, you know, the brown beach and the the different color of the brown um, in the tree trunks and everything. I didn't want that to, to fight. All I wanted people to see was the calming sunset or sunrise. So I took the color out of that. And so the, uh, the leading line goes into that and they just focus on the color there. The same thing in the muted colors of all the leaves right now. You don't um, you know, do, a, do a painting just of the leaves, gather a whole bunch of them up and look at what a cool, cool picture that becomes. Um, God, I don't remember where, where I was going with this one at all. Um, probably the muted colors in it, because that's what we're talking about. You know, even, even his blue um, clothing um, cape that he's wearing is, is still muted. And certainly all the cows that he's leading, uh, or a cow herder, I guess, um, there probably is a word for it. Um, 
are all, all giving you that whole muted, muted color scheme. Okay. okay, so here's the abstract art part. So um, he, you know, if you go to the next slide, but keep kind of remember that, remembering what we have here. Um, abstract artists such as Jackson Pollock threw this concept out the window. This, you know, he opted for it all over composition. This approach involves working into the surface of the piece in a more or less uniform way, rather than top to bottom or, or starting at the center. So he did have some ideas when he was doing it. You can flip back if you can to the one before that. Um, but he does, you know, it's hard sometimes to believe with some abstract pieces if there was any thought behind it. But yes, he really felt he had some composition. So if you take take a look at sometimes at a piece of abstract art that you personally like that you might have hanging in your home and take it apart in its composition and see if you can see why you like it. What, what is there about it that draws you to it? You know, is it just the colors or is it the lines that you feel going through it? Do you, do you actually go through the picture um, with your eye or do you stop? or whatever. So take a look at some of the abstracts that you do have. I don't know if I have another abstract in there, but flip, flip, flip through, um, give me a couple more slides here. Next one. Yeah, I do. Um, so I mean, this one is certainly easy to see, you know, between the triangles and the patterns and the colors and then the beautiful muted shades in the background that, that he used for, totally for the um, total background on it. I mean, you know, this has this is all of all the perfect elements that we've just been talking about. Yet it's it's a it's an abstract piece. That's all it is. So very nice one. So now for um, for some of the photographers, with the rest of you can can learn from this too. These are my two personal pet peeves. So level your horizon and don't cut off limbs. So it's easier for the painters not to cut off limbs, but go to the next slide, please. So level your horizon, next slide. So this is one of my pictures and let's see the horizon goes down. So to me, I would never show this picture. I would never hang this picture, certainly not in my house because it would drive me crazy because that line was going down. Next slide. And you can see where the horizon is supposed to be. So, you know, I before I could do anything with it, I have to cheat, next slide and actually make the horizon where it's supposed to be. You can do this in Photoshop, so it's not a big deal. But now it's an okay picture. Now I will show it to someone and now it's okay. But even when you're painting, I have noticed some painters, they don't pay attention. They just draw the line and, and paint there and that's it. And that could be good for you, but just think of the viewer sometimes and it, and it might just kind of make the viewer always go down a little bit down this side. So just keep that in mind. The next one is don't cut, don't cut off the limbs. So as, as Debbie said, I did do a book called The Cats of Beaufort. And this one would not be in the picture and uh, not be in the book because somehow I cut off the tops of his ears. You don't wanna do that. Not with animals, not with people, no. Next slide. So this is how it's supposed to look. <laughs> the ears should be in the picture. Next slide. So in this picture, I was asked, this is a, um, a pretty famous Gullah artist, um, Diane Britton Dunham down uh, in the low country. And she wanted me to do some publicity shots for her. And one of the ones that I liked best was this shot. And then I noticed that I cut off her hand. So next shot. So that was it. And that's what she ended up getting, <laughs> a head and shoulders because I cut off her finger. Now we did obviously shoot many more pictures that we used. But you know, it was annoying for me to take it home and realize that if I had just stepped back, you know, a foot more, I would have got her finger in, and I should have been aware that I was not getting her finger in. So it's just something to watch, and, and she loved this picture anyway. So that was that was good. Next slide, um, and same idea for a painter. Um, you know, don't cut off the top of the thing, or you've got a little close over here. But you know, give yourself some room when you're. If you're just painting a chair, hey, you know, don't, don't cut off the top of it. <laughs> Next slide. So that's it. So learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist. 
started with that, end with that, go ahead. That's it. So this is it. That's that's the end. That's this is the end. Lots of stuff, lots of stuff for you guys to think about. As I say, you know all this. I hope you know all this. This was just kind of a refresher, putting it all together. So when you get in front of that easel or whatever medium you're using, that you can remember to kind of put some of these thoughts together and create your masterpiece. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. I got any comments, questions? How about on the spot? If not, I can call on you. <laughs> 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 Talk as well. <laughs> what books would you recommend that you recommend? I'm sorry? What books have you written that you would recommend? I have uh, the only books I've written were co coffee table books of photography. Okay. Yeah. I thought maybe yeah. you had something. No, about no, that. no, I don't. I no. really enjoyed yeah. that. Thing. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Can you ask into the microphone if there's any questions from the people? Oh, okay. They can hear me if they're asking like any questions? Okay, any Zoom people that would have a question, if y'all let us know, so we will get it answered while we're here. Either in the chat window or unmute yourself. That's the best way. Okay, we don't have anything coming up. I'm going to ask. Please, um, where's, her, where's her gallery? Because I live in Beaufort. Where's your gallery? Where is your gallery? Okay, I, I exhibit at Beaufort Art Association Gallery in downtown Beaufort. Okay, uh, I'm a member I'm there. Gallery. Excuse me? She said she's a member there. And I'm going to be volunteering there, so I might see you. Mary Monroe. Mary Monroe. Okay. So, yes, a name to look okay. up, right? <laughs> okay. I do the orientations there, so I'm supposed to know. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Okay, um, thank you, Sandy, um, for this very informative presentation on the elements of composition. I know I learned a lot. I'm asking Debbie to come up and she's gonna present you a small token of appreciation. And she's also, wait a minute, we got somebody else. All right, we got a question coming up. Is there a website, book, et cetera, that you recommend for learning composition? Is there a book or composition site that you recommend or a site you recommend it? I will email that to you and so you can put, it, put that on your website because I did not bring that information with me, but I do have one that's, that is a very good one. So you can pass it along however, okay. however way you can do that to your group. Yeah, we, we, will we can put it on the... If you miss, I say, if you miss, said she's going to send us, uh, so we can place it on our website um, and send it to you uh, as far as any website or book that would help with composition. I will do that. Okay. We're making sure nobody else is coming. Okay, all right, Deb. And Deb's going to do the door prizes right after that. We had 29 people, I think is what I counted a while ago. Plus 24 on Zoom. Plus 24 on Zoom. Woohoo! 24 on Zoom. Super, super for our first um, meeting like this. And we look forward to seeing more of you in person next time. Excuse me, there's a new person over here, Michelle. Okay. All right. Uh, let me do this and then I'll, because I've got some other things I need to say to you. Okay. I just wanted to, uh, <laughs> to say to you, Sandy, that we really appreciate you making the trip up here to talk to our group. Okay. We enjoyed the presentation very much. Well, thank you, you were a great audience. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 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 
They know, she knows who. De I'm Debbie, who? 16 on that sheet. Number 16. Uh, Harmon. <sighs> we got some really good letter from the one to 24 on the, on the guest, I mean, on the Zoom. Oh, same number? Tommy Thompson. That's fine. Tommy Thompson is the winner on the uh, door prize for the Zoom. Okay. Now another number. One in 26. Not the one you just called. Eight. Adelia Ruth. Okay, and who was the who was the one there? Oh, you want eight, eight on your yep. So you I guess, yeah. Yeah, we got Julie Larkin. Julie Larkin on the uh, web. I'm on the Zoom. Excuse me. Julie Larkin is the winner. And Julie will be getting a book, The New Spirit of Watercolor. Uh, Zoom people, you need to come to the park and pick up your door prizes. We'll put your name on it and have it at the counter. Okay, still got another number. Laney McWilliams. And Anna K. Sing, um, Sing Singly. And um, Sandra's going to bring you yours, Anna K. All right, and that's it. Okay, that's all the door prizes. Okay, to, to finish up with the last few little things, please make sure um, you look over the revisions for the Constitution and bylaws that was emailed out. Uh, we will be voting on that next time. Yes, Al. Oh, okay. And we have a new member with us tonight. Would you stand and introduce yourself? Michelle Dupree and I live in Chapin. Welcome, Michelle Dupree, a new member that lives in Chapin. And our guest? Daryl. Daryl and Carol Hartman. And they live in Chapin. We look forward to, hopefully y'all will join with us and be with us, okay? Anything else? Okay, then let me finish. Uh, please look over those. We will be voting on that next time. We've taken out a lot of wordiness and put things where they should be. And the revisions have been emailed to everybody. If you're not getting the emails, you need to let us know. Uh, don't forget to sign up for the Still Hope show between now and November the 10th. And please sign up to help with the shows. You can do so online or if you're at the meetings in person, we'd love to have you. And we do need help, I promise you. And if, uh, what? Yeah, so we have two workshops coming up in November, um, oil workshop, and she's amazing. Um, she was a member of the oil company. So uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a still life workshop, but she um, has extensive teaching experience, welcomes beginners to advanced. And right now we have five people enrolled, but the workshops go, so it's a great time to get some one-on-one -on -one attention from a fantastic instructor. Then we have fluid acrylics, second week, second Friday, Saturday of November with Barbie Mathis. Also great um, to just come play and learn something new. You know how many have got signed up right now? I think we have five signed up for that too, and that's going to be a go as well. So good, good chance to get some one-on-one -on -one with. Them. Okay. Anybody else got anything they'd like to add? 
Thank you for those who brought refreshment. Said I greatly appreciate it. And um, with no other announcements, I adjourn this meeting of the Crooked Creek Art League.